All right, how's it going, everyone? Thanks for joining me on a new episode of the Music Career Podcast. My name's Josh. Uh, thanks for tuning in today with a new album review. This is going to be episode 67, and the name of the album is Pressure Machine by the band The Killers, um, a band that really uh, didn't have much promotion leading up to this album. Um, I, I didn't hear any lead singles or any uh, commotion uh, or any, I guess, buzz on the internet. This album was released on August 13th, so uh, less than 10 days ago. I did want to get this review done quite, um, you know, quite soon after it was released. Um, it's not brand spanking new, but it's about a week old, I guess. Um, and yeah, the, pretty surprising, especially considering that the last album was dropped only about a year ago, and I did review it. Um, you know, I remember the podcast being semi sort of fresh, and it's probably one of my best streamed. Um, album reviews on the podcast side so um i don't know if a lot of you guys are tuning in for this episode that like that killers review uh, or if the killers are just so massive that the, anyone will really just tune in to uh some random dude talking about the album but anyways that's what we're gonna be doing today um and uh i'm pretty excited this is a very different album for them it's sort of conceptual in a sense but not really it does follow a sort of theme but we'll get more into that on the review um, but before we get started, just want to let everyone know a new album uh, review did drop not too long ago. Um, at this point, it was released towards the beginning of the month. The name of the album was Claro Sling, the indie pop singer-songwriter, now turned more just singer-songwriter um, with some vintage flair. Uh, it put out a pretty interesting album. If you haven't listened to the album, I, I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, listen to it, but also if you have some time, tune into the review on the podcast side, YouTube side. But really what I was wanting to say before we get started also, uh, I did an EP review. Now usually I've only done one of these. Um, I probably will start doing more, but uh, last, the first one I ever dropped was on the YouTube side only for Sam Gelatry's 4 that released earlier this year. Um, I did a new one with uh, the latest Eve's Tumor uh, EP, The Asymptotical World. I thought this was a really good, really good project. Probably my favorite project this year. Uh, I, I did release it on the podcast side, so it's literally the review right before the one you're listening to now. Did put it on the YouTube side as well. And uh, yeah, I can only say check out that EP. It's killer from front to end. And also, if you have some time, just check out the review too. Um, and while we're at it, uh, new episode of Talking Tracks, episode two, dropped um, not too long ago. Sometime between the EP review and the Claro review. Um, YouTube side only for now. I'm still kind of working out the kinks on Talking Tracks. I got another episode of that on the way. Uh, but, you know, a plethora of artists that we covered on there that I think, uh, you know, we, we talked about a good variety. Um, we covered a track by Still Woozy, Turnstile, uh, Porches, Kississippi, Young Pinch, Jungle. So, uh, yeah. Uh, also Sam Fender, uh, and then the uh, Aventura and Bad Bunny collab single that I thought was interesting. Also, if you're still uh, interested in Best Worst Track of the Week, I dropped um, uh, some condensed episodes at the very end of that episode of Talking Tracks, uh, which was released on August 11th, that's the date, um, for the week of July 31st and August 7th. Uh, went into um, some tracks from Jason Aldean and Carrie Underwood. Uh, Camila Cabello. I don't think it takes much imagination to predict what I probably gave that track. Uh, and then also for the week of July 31st, we covered a track by uh, Pop Smoke off of that posthumous release and uh, a track by uh, this kind of up and coming rap artist, Sleepy Hollow. Uh, those are the four tracks, or four artists, if you will, that uh, I'm talking about on those condensed versions of Best North Track of the Week. Just literally giving the best and worst track now on those. Uh, but I'm enjoying doing it that way. Uh, nonetheless, let's go ahead and get started with this review. So anyways, the band we're talking about today is The Killers. They kind of need no introduction. Um, this is their seventh studio album at this point. The name of the album being Pressure Machine. From what I read, if I'm correct, uh, one of the members let it leak that they're working on their eighth album right now. So it seems like the band has no plans in stopping, even though they've been around for, geez, uh, over 20 years at this point, around 20 years. 
And I guess just to give a little bit of background on the band, uh, if not like anyone needs it, they're from Las Vegas, formed in 2001. The full lineup was completed in about 2002 when they added a bassist and a drummer. And yeah, they're just considered probably at this point one of the biggest rock bands of the 21st century. And they have sold more than 28 million albums, uh, probably more now, because I think this is the number I used on the last album review. Uh, they're an international headliner. They can go pretty much any uh, where in the world, you know, that has if, a, a Western audience, if you will. I don't know about other countries in the, you know, the Eastern part of the world, but they, they can tour um, Europe, US, South America and draw a big crowd. And I guess early on in the band's career, one of the first tracks of two demos they initially wrote was Mr. Brightside, uh, which to this day is an immense hit worldwide, which gets airplay and holds cultural relevance still. And they've just had immense success since their debut releasing in 2003, Hot Fuss. Uh, it, it's an important album in the alternative indie rock 2000s sort of, uh, I guess, uh, history with tracks like Somebody Told Me, Smile Like You Mean It. Uh, their second album, Sam's Town, uh, had a mixed critical reception but featured classics like When You Were Young and Read My Mind. It's safe to say each album uh, has been somewhat of a success after that, um, as well with Day and Age and Battleborn, and even uh, Wonderful Wonderful, which was two albums ago at this point, uh, with maybe Battleborn being the weakest in my opinion. I have been somewhat of a adamant uh, killers listener for most of my life, uh, and I think maybe that one's probably the least memorable, but there's still some nice tracks to take away from even that album as well. And also, uh, at some point, the band released uh, a beast, one of the best B-side albums I've ever heard with uh, Sawdust. Now, I don't remember the exact year that was released, but um, just killer tracks on there as well with uh, the track Tranquilize that featured Lou Reed on there, uh, Under the Gun, Leave the Bourbon on the Shelf, all tracks that probably could have made the album. Shadow Play, the cover of that Joy Division track, they dropped an excellent cover of that as well. Also, the track Sweet Talk is a nice solid cut as well. Um, yeah, just a bunch of uh, tracks that you can, you know, all the pretty faces is, is solid as well. I'm just looking at that tracks, the track listing right now. Uh, just a killer B-side album. I don't know. Uh, if, you know, obviously bands don't really do much of that. It's more of like now the deluxe versions are being released. And I think Sawdust in itself is a valid um, part of this killer's discography. I I really think it's a solid project, and not many bands can say they have a B-side compilation album that is good, better, just as good as maybe some of their albums. Uh, but in that case, it is. And just going back to 2017 with some of the more recent work, um, you know, Wonderful Wonderful was an album that I thought was a pretty typical killer's album. Um, you know, still very much so alternative rock, but I think maybe with a little bit indie pop flair, mainly because I think around that time there was a little bit of an indie pop interest in the general mainstream with tracks like Feel It Still with Portugal the Man. There was just that sort of mainstreamness of indie pop that was kind of going on, and I feel like maybe uh, this this album had a little bit of that going on. Uh, but it also had uh, a really great lead single with The Man, which I think is probably, to this day, one of the more solid uh, Killers lead singles um, to come off of an album release. And the track is still prevalent to this day. I think it's on alternative rock rotation on some stations, maybe if you really wanted to find it. Um, and I think maybe some people, uh, especially some Killers fans, who could probably attest to that being a pretty cool song from The Killers. Uh, but either way, um, after that, there was a bit of a hiatus, not a hiatus, but I guess a break uh, with going into uh, the album prior to this, Imploding the Barrage, which was released in 2020, about a year ago. Um, some pretty cool uh, tidbits from that. Um, th that album was produced by John Everett and Jonathan Radu of Foxygen fame, which uh, Foxygen being um, a pretty well-known indie rock band at this point. The band came up in the early 2010s as being this sort of rebellious, I guess, entity uh, in just like indie rock. 
Yes, they were somehow controversial for some reason, but I'm not, I don't remember the exact reason. And I think it was just a cool artistic way for the killers to go, um, being that imploding the mirage um, kind of took it back a step with, um, you know, uh, their straightforward alternative and indie rock. Um, it seemed like it was going more with this album release in an Americana uh, direction. Um, even with the John Everett production credits, uh, a guy that works a lot with bands like The War on Drugs, which uh, I feel like on that album release, Imploding the Barrage, and even this one on Pressure Machine, um, is quite um, is still quite obvious. Like a lot of these tracks um, are kind of sounding quite similar to like the sort of War on Drugs blend of. Uh, indie rock Americana and folk with like modern day you know production you know quirks and stuff like that um, and I think yeah that that comes from maybe working with guys like John Everett but uh, like I usually do I went back to the most recent album which was Imploding the Mirage just to get a sense of where the band was at and yeah I kind of forgotten a bit about this album uh, I didn't really, I haven't really gone back and listened to it much. Um, there are some interesting tracks, though. Um, uh, Caution was the band's lead single, which was quite big when I think it was first released. I think a lot of people were hyped for hearing new killer stuff. Uh, I really dug uh, the ambient intro and buried vocal line at the very beginning of the track. Uh, but holy reverb on that, especially on Brandon Flowers' vocals. Um, a huge, big arrival on the chorus when that track really goes in uh, onto that part. And I guess uh, this is a good example of that war on drugs influence, the soaring synth lines, the acoustic guitars that just peek through the mix. Uh, a very Americana-esque as well, maybe a bit Tom Petty-like. Um, I do dig like the... Uh, nice gospel vacuum vocals we get at points in the track uh, but somewhat it's just a bit overly derivative like I've heard this kind of song before in different bits and pieces of other songs uh, and then also some really loud drum pounding on the chorus that adds some nice energy um, I will say that's kind of noticeable when you first listen to it and you know an actual guitar solo used as well which if I didn't if I wasn't mistaken, I just read was maybe played by Lindsey Buckingham. I didn't know that. Uh, and then also after that, we have another highlight with Lightning Field featuring Kid Light, which was kind of an offshoot track. It is very interesting and colorful towards the beginning, but loses a lot of flair as the track, I guess, sort of uh, develops a little bit. Track The track has some new wave elements. It's a bit overly 80s. Um, but yeah, it, it there's some nice melodic ideas thrown in by Brandon Flowers and a piercing piano gestures that embellish the track quite nicely. I just don't think it's consistent from front to end. Uh, after that, we have another experimental track that I thought was pretty interesting with Fire and Bone. Um, there's some nice momentum on here, with some lovely bass that supports the track all throughout. I thought maybe there was some interesting Davy Bowie influence on here, but I think it's been better described by other people as being more um, Talking Heads. I'm not too familiar with Talking Heads discography as I should be, but uh, hell, if I, it probably does sound like it from the stuff I've heard from the Talking Heads. It's an experimental track, and I really like the direction uh, the Killers went on here. Unfortunately, I didn't really hear it at all on this new album, Pressure Machine. Uh, Running Towards a Place was a cool track as well. Um, some obvious Fleetwood Mac influence, especially on the opening guitar riffs and the accompanying bass line. Some more War on Drugs, like Sonic Textures, but it was an interesting track. Some nice melodic bass groups, uh, some soaring synth lines. But yeah, overall, I thought the track was, the album, I'm sorry, was solid. Um, I thought it was a, a nice project, especially for like all the turmoil that the band had faced. Um, I guess with the midst of the pandemic and then I guess the original bassist and guitarist not really being as present in the band. I think they left touring. Um, they left their touring duties, but then eventually the, something happened where the guitarist uh, left to uh, just left the band completely. But the killers were like, hey, man, you can join if you want. And I guess he joined again after this. 
And then also the bassist uh, suffered like some traumatic hearing loss during uh, some performance uh, where he was playing bass for, I think, maybe another band and some pyrotechnical failure happened. It's really weird to hear about. But I guess somehow he's he's able to play bass again with the band if he wants to. So uh, I guess this album was released in the midst of all that going on. I thought for all those distractions, they put out a solid effort. I gave that review, uh, that album a 6 out of 10. Going from, you know, imploding the Mirage to pressure the machine, or pressure machine, sorry. Uh, this, this new album is just a different breed of its own. Um, it, it, it's conceptual in a sense because I think it references the small town that Brandon Flowers grew up in and the social issues that presented itself with the town and the social issues that are presented with living in a town like that with drugs and um, you know all sorts of things that I guess little America faces that no one really pays attention to. And with that being said, um, there is like a overarching, I guess, political theme to it as well that I, I'm sure leans a certain way. You know, I thought that was interesting because I, I not to say that the Killers can't be a political band. And, and then with Brandon Flowers being an interesting figure in himself with being raised Mormon or still being Mormon, I don't really know what that, what it is. Um, just some interesting insight into you know, what small town America or growing up in small town America is. Uh, but I will say it, it is presented as a very dark uh, way of living. Um, and yeah, for, first of all, there's a bunch of uh, narration on here with, I guess, characters or maybe even real recordings of people describing and living in this small town. And uh, that's, you immediately get that when you listen to the opening track, West Hills. But yeah, um, with all that said and done, with you know this being a very different conceptual sort of thing, and not just track to track, back to back, and you know it's just indie rock and alt rock cuts, uh, this this new album presents itself as like this um, folk based Americana based uh, album. There are a lot of the typical killers, uh, alternative rock, you know, signature sounds in here here and there uh but you know the the album really doesn't open up as such and it is an interesting and different direction from the past couple of albums um i'm not sure if it's an improvement though um it it definitely is overly ambitious and i can't respect the killers for doing something like that um you know like i was saying earlier the album opens up with like this narration on the track uh, West Hills, which is probably the one of the most ambitious and grandiose tracks to open up this thing. Uh, I'm not sure if I like this being the opening cut, but it certainly makes a statement. Um, we get immediately this folk aesthetic formed by like this bright mandolin and dry plucked guitar, you know, a haunting color on Brandon Flowers' voice. A uh, drum track that can maybe sound a little faint, but I do like the rumbling nature on the low end of this track. Uh, a nice driving bass line as the track you know develops and progresses some squealing and uncomfortable textures at points in the in the track as well uh, and then here we maybe get a hint of a light war on drugs influence not so much hammered on uh as the previous album but it's still definitely there and i guess now is a good time to say they use the exact same producers from the previous album so i guess they really liked working with ratto and ever after that we get uh quiet town which i didn't quite fine to be much of a, a highlight but i thought it was an interesting album uh or an interesting track it's uh there's some ominous spoken word to open it up again a bright 80s upbeat pop aesthetic definitely uh leaning on like the americana bruce springsteen sort of style um but i do like the mobile and melodic bass line on here uh digging the organic instrumentation uh and then you know there is like some added harmonica but but I think it was maybe a little bit too similar to like how it was used like in the 90s, you know, a la Blues Traveler, that sort of thing. I feel like it was just a bit of a distraction uh, because of that. But, you know, still interesting hearing harmonica uh, as prominent as it is used on this track. Uh, after that, when you get a, one of the more low-key cuts, terrible thing, it's a stripped-down track. 
Uh, it's a pretty exposed track, probably one of the more darker tracks on here that I think confronts suicide. Um, it's quite uh, overly simple texturally. It's very stripped down, uh, but I will say there's a nice uh, vocal performance by Flowers on here. After that, we get uh, Cody, which I thought was interesting in the sense that there was a nice jammy instrumental that guided the track by like this dense and cutting bass line. And then towards the end of the track, uh, there's some nice colorful horns that are added on and a nice melodic fiddle, which I will say the auxiliary instrumentation on this album is quite prevalent, but it's used quite tastefully most of the time. Um, uh, in this case of the track Cody, I think it's done nicely. Uh, it, but I will say the track is just maybe a bit unsuspecting, especially when we get this really weird, unfitting power rock guitar solo for a few seconds and then that's it. Uh, it was just a bit of a head scratcher on there. Sleepwalker, I feel like, was a highlight. Uh, it's a, it starts out with a very bright plucked mandolin or, or maybe like this synth texture. I couldn't tell what that opens up the track. Uh, here we're back to some more pop flair. That's War Killers, I guess, typical. Uh, the interesting strummed and trebly bass line that guides much of the track is really nice. And on here we get a more crisp drum track here in comparison to the rest of the album thus far. Uh, much of the drum work uh, up until this point was a bit faint or just um, not as prominent. It's definitely an outlier on this album, uh, even though it's the most familiar sounding Killers track thus far. And yeah, I guess that's a good way to put this album this far, that at the point we're already four songs in with Sleepwalker, we get a track that sounds very familiar with how Killers usually goes about making music, and it's probably like the most unfitting track thus far. Um, after that, we get a nice highlight with Runaway Horses. Um, there's a typical small town girl, uh, I guess, th theme that the Killers kind of hit on on a lot of their tr uh, albums. Um, this is the track with... Uh, Phoebe Bridgers doing some vocal, you know, harmonies in the chorus, uh, I guess providing it, doing like a nice little duet with Brandon Flowers. Uh, I was somehow able to uh, pick out her voice and all that because she's uncredited. So, um, yeah, it, it's it's a bit subtle, but she's definitely there. And uh, she she kind of kills it. She, she sort of um, does just enough to not, you know, take the focus away from Flower's performance, but uh, she blends in quite well. But I will say the overall vocal performance, I don't know, I don't think it's Phoebe Bridger's fault, but it's just a bit static. It, it It's presented in a way where it's sung um, in a, you know, in a fashion that's just there to complement the track, but it doesn't really climax or, uh, you know, go in a, an interesting direction. It's just executed nicely. Um, I, I like the subject matter that the song covers, though. Uh, I, you know, from you know, small town girls growing up, you know, uh, I guess in in a fashion where they're usually known for being, you know, nice or generous, and then I guess something happens along the way where they kind of just lose all their inspiration and desires for settling for like a some sort of mediocre life or some tragedy happens. It's it's an interesting, you know, track. But yeah, overall, it's a pretty sounding track. Not my favorite Killers track I've heard, but it's certainly not the worst. Uh, after that, we get a pretty interesting cut with In the Car Outside. Here, the track's presented with some 80s New Ways influence that the Killers typically do on their albums. Really digging the slide guitar that's playing off the main theme of the track. Uh, wish it popped out a bit more, but it's nice that it's there. Um, back to like a bigger presence on the drums. That's somehow rare on this album with how stripped down some of the tracks feel. Uh, but I like the driving nature of the drum track. It's somewhat natural yet mechanical with the way it drives the track. Um, but I will say it just takes a weird, interesting turn on the bridge when we get like a drum machine, it sounds like. It's just this sort of jerky sort of occurrence on this track. Uh, but the track kicks off nicely. The ending instrumental outro is a bit by the numbers. It's very elongated, kind of like maybe how you'd expect you know, a an like a typical arcade fire instrumental out outro that just hits the same chord progression and and you know I guess riff or something for like a minute or two, uh, but it does sound at like the grandiose level that usually a band like Arcade Fire likes to like take something like that, um, but I feel like it, it didn't quite belong on this album. 
and, and it could have used maybe a bit more flavor, if you will. Um, but yeah, interesting cut. I thought it was a highlight. In Another Life, uh, I really dig the rich sounding instrumental here. It's a bit alt rock like. It's like maybe like keen or slight cold play, especially with how it kicks off and how Brandon Flowers see sounds a bit distinguished here. He doesn't sound like he typically does, but I really dig the the vocals on this track, especially on the opening verse. Um, love the thematic synth melodies that come in and out of this track, the nice driving bass line. It's not a bad cut. I will say though, the acoustic guitars can maybe sound a bit too thin here, but it's not bad either. After that, we get a track called Desperate Things. This is probably one of my favorite tracks um, on this album. It, it's probably one of the more interesting ones too. Um, it, it's, especially with how this track just kind of opens up in a twangy sort of country inspired way with the guitar. Um, it kind of creates this serene and dreaminess to like this story that's about to be told. But it is a bit of a preachy track, I'll say that. Um, but it does have like this sort of desert psych rock nature to it, especially with the haunting color on Brandon Flowers' voice on here. It's a weighty track though, um, with a lot of eeriness that comes in as the track develops. It kind of has the story of, of a cop pulling over this lady that was just a victim of domestic violence and he questions her and asks, do you want me to, you know, arrest your abuser, which was her boyfriend, I think. And, um, you know, it, it ends up becoming where the lady uh, ends up having an affair with the cop uh, that's married with children. And, and the whole, I guess, premise of it is that uh, people fall in love in desperate situations. But anyways, I think the track ends tragically with the cop, I think, maybe killing uh, or finding her abuser and killing her at this bar he hangs out with and that's the desperate thing that he does when he's in love and acts out of character. It's an interesting track, it's a little political too, I think, along with a lot of these tracks, but I thought, I guess, I guess story-wise, that this was a really excellent track because it kept me interested most of the time uh, from front to end. Pressure Machine, uh, here is when the, tr the album, you know, we're towards the end at this point and, um, I think it's just wanting to end. I don't know if maybe the the steam engine or what would the driving force of the ideas on here was running out by this point. Um, it's a very filler track. Uh, it's very light in terms of presence. I will say though, Brandon goes really in on the vocals. He's in a very high register, an unnaturally high one. Uh, but I'm kind of impressed by how smooth the execution was. Um, and I think thematically it's just hitting on like the blue collar struggles in a small town again. And then after that, we get a, a the ending track um, that is a bit sleepy, but you know, if you really, if you're patient, like I think most people should be with this album. It took me maybe by the second or third listen, I guess getting more into this. Um, yeah. But once I started listening to things like the addition of the backing vocal harmonies that are really flavorful and beautiful on this track, I did think, you know, the track did have some quality to it. But the track is very stripped down with the way it's structured around this plucked steel guitar. But it's a bit head scratching and, you know, it doesn't end on much of a climax or develop into one either. It's just kind of presented as it is as soon as it opens up. And, you know, it's it, it's just kind of summing up everything. If anything, it's a bit more like commentary just about, you know, the stuff that is being observed in this town, or if you will. And yeah, by the time we're here, we're at the end of the album. And I will say the, al the album does kind of go through different phases, in my opinion. It gets stronger towards the middle. The opening is, you know, a bit mediocre and then... It doesn't really end on a great high note, but I can understand, you know, the direction of going that way with it just being, it's supposed to be a dark album. So I think the way it ends, is just supposed to kind of put it to rest, whatever's being told on here. Um, and I think the, the best thing to get out of this is just, it's just a different direction the Killers went in. But yeah, I really think if the Killers could have just made the same album again at this point in their careers, and it would have been you know, decently regarded and 
we would have got a, a killer lead single like The Man or something like that or Caution. Everyone's so hyped about or, uh, you know, it it's one of the better tracks off the album. And then they kind of just put a few more good cuts. And then maybe another single comes out from the album that does well. Um, but this in itself, I mean, with it being released the way it was and it being very thematic um, and focused on, you know, very real issues. Yeah, that in itself just makes me appreciate, I guess, the body of work for what it is. Um, and like I was trying to say earlier, I think this is an album that should have uh, be listened to with patience. If you're trying to go in expecting Sam's Town or Hot Fuss, you're not going to get that at all on this. Uh, especially with the the emphasis on the folkiness and the Americana. Uh, they, they sound like they're kind of like a throwback act, honestly. Uh, a lot of it sounds very Springsteen-like in a, on some of these tracks uh, with just Brandon Flowers singing vocals instead. Uh, but anyways, yeah. Uh, I did enjoy this album, but I will say it was a struggle sometimes to kind of get into. I think if anything, this album had uh, a lot, a lot of potential, uh, but maybe just uh, it, it just got lost in how ambitious it was trying to be. Uh, overall, I'm feeling like a six out of ten on this, uh, a very different six out of ten than like when I gave the last album. Imploding the Mirage a 6 out of 10. This is more of like, this is like a respect 6 out of 10. Uh, because I really think something was trying to be said and something different was trying to be done here. Um, but I, unfortunately, I think this this album could be a rift in the, the killer's discography. Especially um, amongst like the people that more so than me follow the killers and like the killers. Um, I, I'm not sure if this this sort of direction is what people want to see moving forward. We'll just have to see in the next album release what happens. I personally don't see this being done again by the band just because it seems like something you can only really do once. And then after that, what is the band really doing at that point? I guess because past a certain point, uh, if the band considers to do this uh, or continues to do this, they're really just, I guess, reinventing themselves and kind of throwing away any sort of connection to like the debut album hot fuss because like that album and this album if you really had to put it into a clear-cut way are like night and day yeah i think that's just the best way to put it like um if you went back to the end of hot fuss and uh the killers immediately after that released pressure machine uh, I think that would have possibly have been like the last time the band would have seen the mainstream, which I think is probably the main reason why this album doesn't have lead singles because I, I think it would have been a hard sell to put on like stations that play alternative rock and indie rock and stuff like that. But we'll see. Maybe some of them will make radio rotation. That's not really something I really care about. But anyways, um, yeah. Yeah. 6 out of 10, thought it was an interesting album. I think anyone that's genuinely genuinely interested in The Killers should give this album a try. And maybe even give it more than one listen. Uh, don't base your judgments on just one listen. I think most albums don't deserve just one listen. I think one listen would really misconstrue uh, how this album is supposed to be digested. But anyways, yeah, I don't know who else would really like this. Maybe like, like hardcore or old school Americana fans that really dig Springsteen and stuff like that. Maybe like some diehard war and drugs listeners will get something out of this, even though, you know, it's not really a carbon copy of that band. It just has some hints of it and the production is very similar. Uh, we'll have to see. Uh, I don't see the killers really gaining a new audience from this. Uh, unfortunately, I think, I think people that are just very in tune with what's being released, um, you know, by various bands would maybe have interest in this. Um, so basically, yeah, <laughs> their fan base that's established already. I, I don't see this uh, making the rounds as a, a overhyped album. I've already seen some of like the press releases over the, the reviews, and I think the reception's very mixed. Uh, so yeah, anyways, yeah, we'll see. I thought it was good, 
but um, certainly thought it could have been better. Uh, but anyways, thanks for tuning in to the epi- end of this episode uh, and the review. I know it's a bit lengthy, but I uh, really appreciate you tuning in. If you are on YouTube, like and subscribe there if you like what you heard. Also, uh, st- stream on your preferred listening service, uh, the podcast. Leave a comment if you want to. But other than that, take it easy. I'll see you later.